chose Galen because of its strong reputation. Great scholarships. I came because I can take all my classes online. Because Galen University opens doors to the outside world. Their course offering in tourism. It gives me more opportunity to become who I want to be. If you want to connect with your inner champion to make the world a better place, then Galen is right for you. Did you know? Did you know that your Sajikor advisor can help you plan how to make your golden years your best years? Call a Sajikor agent today. I had a really good time tonight. So did I. Life moves fast. Be prepared with Sajikor. Learn more at sajikorlife.com. Good morning and welcome to Morning Matters. Our guest this morning is Mr. Carlos Fuller. Mr. Fuller is the Regional and International Liaison Officer at the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. His primary responsibility is to coordinate CARICOM member states in the international climate change negotiations. He's a meteorologist and was the Chief Meteorologist in the National Meteorological Service of Belize. He has represented Belize in the climate change negotiation process in 1990. In that capacity, he serves as chair of the subsidiary body of scientific and technical advice of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 2017 and 2018. He is presently the chief negotiator on climate change for the Alliance of Small Island States under the chairmanship of Belize. His awards include the George Price Lifetime Achievement Award for Emergency Management and Officer of the Order of British Empire for Public Service. Mr. Fuller, good morning and welcome. It's a pleasure to meet, uh, be with you, Rhonda. The pleasure is all mine. You are the man that everybody wants to talk to, especially this time of year. You know, um, you have such a wealth of experience that we still trust you. You know, um, but before we get into that, let's learn a little bit about who Carlos Fuller is. Um, we couldn't find anything on you on LinkedIn. Is that how you had it designed? Is that your strategy so that we have to talk to you to learn about you? Uh, well, yes, indeed. In fact, you know, I was on LinkedIn for a while. However, uh, since I'm not in the business of, of you know, of uh, employment and so on, and I kept getting these, uh, these messages through LinkedIn, I said, let, let me come off it uh, because I might be leading people astray. <laughs> Well, well, here we are. So now we will learn everything from your lips. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how you grew up. Oh, certainly. Uh, so I'm a Belizean. I uh, grew up in Belize City. Uh, however, uh, my mother was from Benke. And so every summer I would uh, go to, uh, to Benke in Western Belize, where I would live with my grandparents, who did not speak a word of English. So I was forced uh, to be bilingual, meeting my cousins uh, there. And so basically I grew up bilingual uh, through Belize, uh, did all my primary, secondary, and uh, sixth grade education in Belize. And uh, when I joined the Met Service, uh, I was fortunate uh, a couple of years later to be awarded a scholarship. So I did my degree in meteorology in the US at Florida State University, came back home and continued my career in the Met Office in Belize. Well, good. Let's talk a little bit about your home life growing up. Did you have siblings? And if you did, what was that situation like? Uh, yes, I have uh, one sister uh, still living uh, in Belize. And uh, so uh, my, uh, my mother and my father uh, were with us many, many years. Uh, and um, my father passed away uh, at the age of 55, so fairly young. Uh, but we grew up as a very tight, close-knit uh, family, uh, lived together, um, you know, um, all, all these years. And, um, and so, in fact, I still see my sister on a, on a weekly basis. Out of both of your parents, who would you say uh, had the most influence over your life? Uh, you know, um, I would give them uh, equal credit uh, as long as my father uh, was alive. Um, I would, uh, I would, he was a very practical uh, person, and I would never recall, uh, forget the last words he, he told me before I left for the U.S. Uh, no, uh, uh, um, when, when I graduated, uh, his words were always, uh, Carlos, 
um, you 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 get a job uh, and you spend eight hours a day on your job. Um, you sleep for eight hours, and uh, and only eight hours are really yours. So those eight hours, and you pick your your job, make sure you like it. Um, because it is useless to uh, only spend one third of your life uh, in something you enjoy. So uh, I was very fortunate that um, when somehow I stumbled into meteorology, it was something uh, that I liked, and it seemed to like me also. Um, but I said, my, but my father uh, passed away um, when I was, I think, 25 or 26 years old. So then after that, it was really my mother uh, only. Um, and, uh, and she really instilled uh, a sense of, seeing what nature was like. She was a great observer. I, I found out later in life, uh, she would be noticing, uh, you know, uh, stars, uh, the moon, uh, uh, wildlife around her. So that really, uh, actually, uh, I, I kept learning from her uh, throughout my life. Well, good. What did your father do? Uh, my, my father uh, was a clerk uh, at, um, at that time, it was the Belize Diesel, and then later Hopius. Um, so he, he was a, a clerk uh, in the hardware business. You said you stumbled into meteorology. How does one stumble into meteorology? Well, very interestingly, um, uh, at sixth form, my math teacher was the then chief meteorologist, uh, Kendrick Leslie. And uh, on the last week of school, he asked me, Carlos, what are you going to do? Um, and I said, well, you know, I will look in the newspapers, apply for some job, uh, see what's available. And he said, well, you know, I have two vacancies available at the Met office. Um, why don't you try uh, meteorology? So I graduated on Sunday and I reported to work on Monday and, uh, and I tried it for 34 years. <laughs> Talk about consistency, talk about commitment. You are definitely a man of commitment. I don't, um, so well done. Did you have any interest before that? Were you one of the people that listened to the weather or go out fishing and thought you knew what the weather would be like or anything like that? Absolutely not. I don't think I had ever listened to a weather report uh, prior to that. The only thing I recall about the weather when I was growing up was in 1961, on the 30th of October, my father rushed home at midday and said, Carlos, go back to school, get your school things, get your sister, and he shipped my mother and the two of us out to Benke uh, on the 30th of October. I did not return to Belize City until May the following year because this Belize City had been destroyed by Hattie. Uh, schools were out, but, I, but the following week I was in school in Benke, so I, I did not miss out on school. Uh, but that was my only touch with weather prior to me joining the Met Office uh, back in 1974. Wow. Well, I'm see, I see that you made clear note of that. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, when did you start to get your formal training as a meteorologist and where did you get it? Well, when you join the Met Office uh, in Belize, you, you basically go into like a four month on the job uh, training. Um, you are taught some, uh, some theory and a lot of practical work. And, uh, and when you join, uh, you join as, a, as this trainee weather observer. And, uh, and then uh, once uh, you, you then work along with someone, and then once you are um, capable of, they, they see you're able to recognize clouds, uh, do the transmission on the, at that time you were teletypes, uh, plotting weather charts. Uh, when you are able to do that, you're then uh, put on your own on your shift. Interestingly, however, that first year uh, when, I, when I joined, we had uh, Hurricane Carmen in September, uh, threatened uh, the South. Um, and then a month later, Hurricane Fifi, and so um, after those two episodes, uh, the chief meteorologist said, Carlos, you went through hurricanes. You don't, you don't need four months. You're on your own. Uh, so that was really uh, where uh, that training occurred. Um, and I said, and, and then I, I was fortunate that I had passed my two A-levels uh, coming out of sixth form. And so I was eligible for scholarships. And the U.S. Weather Service granted me a scholarship uh, to study meteorology at Florida State University uh, in, 19, uh, in 1976. So I went, I went up there, and, uh, and um, in 1979, I graduated my degree in meteorology, um, did my apprenticeship at the National Hurricane Center in Miami, uh, and management in Washington, D.C., and came home and uh, became uh, a, meteor a meteorologist and a weather forecaster. 
you became what we would have said the weatherman. Do you think that <laughs> do you think that the Met officers are unappreciated? Seem to be that the only time we remember you is when you get the weather what we say as wrong, or maybe pilots might have a special appreciation for you. But outside of that, I'm not sure. Uh, well, uh, yes, indeed. So. The, um, the weather services in the Caribbean in general, uh, the Met offices uh, have many different clients. So the one that the people are more familiar with would be the, the public weather service, the weather report that we would uh, give in the morning, uh, in, in the evening and so on. However, um, the airline industry does rely on the Met service uh, significantly. And so uh, we do provide uh, this hourly weather information and constant briefings uh, to the air traffic control, uh, to the pilots providing briefings for them and so on. So uh, that is certainly one aspect of it. In the case of Belize, uh, we are also providing uh, services to the military. Again, uh, with British forces uh, here, we would also provide that services. And where agriculture is significant, again, we would provide services uh, to the agricultural industry, um, where there are forests, the for forest fire warnings. So um, we do have various clients that we will be providing the service to, uh, you know, on a routine basis. What was it like being the voice that people trusted? I mean, you, whatever you say, was life and death for a lot of people. What was that responsibility like for you? Um, well, it's certainly something um, that we, we took um, very seriously. And uh, I guess it just happened to be that when I became uh, the chief, chief meteorologist in Belize, um, we then went into a very high uh, activity near Belize. So suddenly uh, I became uh, you know, prominent. And indeed, also what had occurred just prior to that was that um, we introduced TV weather forecasting in Belize prior to these events. So our faces had become familiar also on, on television, where before it had, was only on, on radio. And so, um, you know, there was a face uh, to the voice now. Um, and so I was very fortunate also to have a very strong professional uh, people behind me. So while people were seeing my voice, we had very good uh, meteorologists in the background providing data um, weather observers, uh, people um, maintaining the weather radar, launching our weather balloons. So I had a lot of technical information being fed into me. So I, I felt very confident when I was uh, speaking to the public. I knew what I was talking about uh, because I, I had strong data behind me. And in fact, even our connections with the National Hurricane Center in Miami, because we were meeting with them two or three times a year, they were confident with me and they were sending information to me. So indeed, um, while I, I always said I was merely the face and merely the voice, other people were speaking through me. I was just articulating their words. Well, was there ever a day when you, that face and that voice, got the wrong information and as a result, the wrong things were delivered to the people? And if so, what was that experience like? Um, I I don't think so much it was wrong information, um, but a lot of different kinds of information was coming in, and you then had to be able to sift through uh, what was coming in, recognizing what was maybe too sensational, uh, and, uh, and, and I always felt that I needed to be calm to tell people, look, I'm telling you this thing early. Um, I will always pose the worst case scenario um, in, uh, for you so that you take action uh, and not say, well, you know, you're on the skirts, you don't have to worry so much. No, I was, the impression was, I tried to give was, you need to take action now. And if something doesn't happen, be glad that it doesn't happen. I, you know, many people will say, well, you, talk, you told me this major hurricane was coming and I got nothing, but aren't you glad that nothing happened? <laughs> You know, they can't eat all that corned beef and all that tin sausage, so they were probably not happy. But like you said, I mean, you are not God. You can only come so close with your science. Um, what kept you but, there? But Rona, can, can I also say something about that? I, uh, I, I will try to tell people, well, you know, you're, you're, you're getting the corned beef for the hurricane season. Where at the end of the hurricane season, you actually have something you can donate to the red to, uh, to, uh, to the pantry to somebody for Christmas, so that indeed you know you can um, you can use your um, good luck and help others uh, in December. You know that is how you look at it. So you hear that he's still giving good advice.
Years later, you're still giving good advice. I kept you there for 30 plus years. I mean, one would say you could have retired a long time ago, or you could have switched careers, or you could have gone and worked somewhere else in the Caribbean with your experience. Um, why did you stay there for this long? Um, well, you know, um, Belize gave me an opportunity that I never thought would have happened. When, as a weather forecaster, when I saw, when, sorry, as a weather observer, when I saw the, what was involved in it, um, to me, it was like being a, a detective. Uh, you got these clues of, hmm, this is what the weather is like. The chart tells me what is possible, and I need to do this. And I was, wanted to be a weather forecaster. Events happened... Uh, Strangely enough, that I rose very quickly to become the head of the of the of the weather service, and things were always happening, dynamic. I was I was into development, and it also gave me an opportunity to actually uh, do a lot of international traveling. Uh, and so, indeed, I was very fortunate that uh, every everything was fulfilling uh, along the way. Um, and so, I, I stayed with it, uh, you know, uh, and many other things came up including climate change. Uh, and uh, so I get getting challenges from the government and from internationally that I was able uh, to live up to. And, and so it never became boring. Oh, good. On that note, we're going to take a break and be back. It's me, your Uncle Cooper, and this is a Cooper tire. Great tire. Now, it's not going to cook you a pot roast, but it will stop when you hit the brakes. And these truck tires can stop on average 10 feet shorter than other tires on a wet road. See, the trick is in the grip. And these tires grip like my handshake. Look, I'm your uncle. I love you. I want you to stop when you need to. Doesn't matter if it's for a red light or a duckling. So go with the Coopers. Cooper! And never start something you can't stop. Here at Coop Sheet Metal, we believe our job is very essential in serving our customers. And that is just one reason why visiting us is an experience to be remembered. Here at Coop Sheet Metal, we have a reliable fleet of trucks. We specialize in countrywide delivery of all our material. Coop Sheet Metal is a family business that was started by my grandfather, who even had many of his machines hand-built decades ago to make our products the most reliable in Belize. Come visit us at our new facility on Iguana Creek Road, just past the Belize River, leading to Spanish Lookout. I choose Happy Cow Cheese because of its perfect portion sizes, and I can travel with it. Because it's nice and soft and creamy and it goes smooth by your bread. I choose a Bicot cheese because I eat it with my beans. I eat it with my fried jock. And you know why? Because it's nice. Most of all, when you're on plane, you know they only give you some crackers and you can just take one out and enjoy it with Happy Cow Cheese. I'm Miss Baker and I choose Happy Cow Cheese because it goes well with all the stuff I bake. Happy Cow Cheese, look for it in a store near you. Distributed in Belize exclusively by Emilio Ahmad and Sons Limited. Did you know that it's best to keep the lumber stored in a dry place? At KT Enterprises, all our wood is stored in an enclosed space. To provide our clients with the highest quality. We allow you to personally select your lumber if you choose and we deliver countrywide. Be it deck board, beams, and imported hardwood such as red oak and white ash. At KT Enterprises, we provide you with the highest grade in treated pine. Construction grade plywood and imported hardwood. Delivered to your door. We continue to build Belize by reforesting its pine forest. Visit us today at 2.3 miles Iguana Creek Road or give us a call at 671-0114 or 672-0114. Let's face it, everything has changed. You're at home, your kids are home, we're all at home. And right now it's more important than ever to stay safe by staying inside. And staying inside means watching a lot more TV. My TV. With MyTV, you can now stream up to 100 channels of live news updates, pay-per-view events and movies on demand on any of your devices. No strings attached. We are making it easier so you can stay informed and entertained. 
Let's do our part to keep our communities safe. Do the right thing and stay connected with NextGen. Signing up is easy. Apply for your MyTV subscription on our website at www.centraltv.bz. NextGen, powered by Central TV and Internet. New Buildings Limited is the company of choice when it comes to design, fabricating, and erection of wide-span metal buildings in Belize. At New Buildings, we have a team of well-trained professionals that can produce the most innovative and durable metal structures. Be it domestic or industrial buildings, we can get it done for you. We have put together some of the most outstanding metal structures in the country. We also do estimates and consulting. Visit new buildings in Spanish Lookout or give them a call at 631-8723 or 610-5185. New Buildings Limited, the experts when it comes to metal structures in Belize. At West Track Belize City, we are looking to help you save both your time and money. We've also improved our stock levels to ensure we have everything you might need for your automotive or agricultural needs. Additionally, West Track has added heavy duty and industrial parts to keep your trucks and equipment running. At West Track Belize City, we understand that your time is important, so we want to bring our services to you at your convenience. Now you can simply send us a message on WhatsApp or Facebook and we will be right there to help with any questions you may have. P-TECH has been in Belize now for more than six years. We specialize in residential and industrial high quality glass windows and doors. I'm Melvin Reimer from Discount Auto Sales. I chose P-TECH windows because I'm quite impressed about the way they're manufactured. These are double uh, pane glasses, they're called low E, that keeps out a lot of the heat. Check us out at p-tek.com or give us a call at 671-3842. P-TECH windows and doors, a leader in its class. Me and my Marie Sharps in In Lake. Me and my Marie Sharp in Indiana. I'm in Rodonda Beach, California with my Marie Sharp. Me and my Marie Sharp in Kabul, Afghanistan. Me and my Marie Sharp that are hard for your England. Me and my Marie Sharps in Taipei, Taiwan. Marie Sharp, world class products produced in Belize. Mr. Fuller, welcome back. My pleasure. The pleasure is all mine, I'll tell you. You were at the Met Service over a period of time. You saw many changes from, I mean, different changes. Um, is there, would you say, how has the technology changed to be better able to predict the weather over the time? The changes that I observed and are st and are still observing, it is amazing. So when I was at the Met Office back in 19, as I said, 1974, we had a weather radar that had just been installed in 1970, and it was analog. Um, you had this big CRT screen, uh, this big round screen that you uh, you saw you saw the uh, you know the weather on, and. Um, and now the weather radar is now digital. You use a computer screen, mouse. The mouse was not even invented back then. And, and so that was the kind of uh, radar then. We used to transmit the, uh, our weather observations every hour on a teletype. These big, huge, clunky things uh, that you, and I still type with my two fingers because of that. You had to press the buttons hard, <laughs> uh, you know, transmitting information, cutting a, a, a tape that you would then fed into it and, and you, you transmitted it uh, out that way. Um, the, uh, we, we got a radio facsimile back then uh, that would use this chemical paper that would print uh, satellite imagery on these big uh, things that were maybe two feet wide that you would get uh, these this chemical things on. The great thing about being in the weather, which also maybe kept me there, was that it was always cutting edge technology. So, uh, uh, you know, we were the only ones that would have radio facsimile. Uh, and then later on, um, when computers came along, the Met Office got the first computer in the country of Belize. Would you believe it? This, uh, and this was a, an HP uh, with 16 bytes of memory that cost 25,000 US dollars. That was what <laughs> computers were like at that time. <laughs> One little computer. Your cell phone has a million times more memory now and cost $100, but cost $25,000 at that time. Yeah. So yes, we have seen fantastic changes uh, uh, where that is concerned. But in 
in addition to that, we now have much more information coming in um, from various weather satellites. At that time, uh, we had two polar orbiting satellites that will send information every 12 hours. We now have uh, satellites that produce Im images every 15 minutes. Um, so as I said, I can actually see thunderstorms developing over me right now on my, uh, on my cell phone. <laughs> well, good. You and the rest of us. And it doesn't matter if you are retired or not. We still, we, I don't know what it is about people and how we see the Met officers. I mean, we think they know something that perhaps they don't know without the right um, technology, but we feel that you could go outside and you could look and you can tell where it's going to rain and where it's not going to rain. And perhaps with experience, you can say that. Um, well, in fact, you know, there, are, there is a segment of the population uh, in the Caribbean, around the world that has done that. Local communities and indigenous peoples uh, have that sense of being able to recognize the atmosphere, what is occurring around them. Um, they, they can actually, uh, you know, look at clouds, uh, sense the winds, look at nature, butterflies, birds, ants, uh, plants out there, and they have a very holistic view of nature and can sense uh, these things uh, and related knowledge. Uh, scientists, we tend to be very in our little cocoons and we watch things very systematically in a certain way that we don't see this bigger picture. We require all this other kind of information. And, uh, and so now the, um, uh, what is now at the forefront, how do we merge these two, uh, these two aspects? Getting the uh, indigenous knowledge uh, and coupling that with scientific uh, data and coming together to, to look at things much more holistically. Um, and we recognize that, um, that scientists have created problems because, because of that. Uh, you know, we would, uh, we would uh, for example, um, uh, block, block a river to, to, um, uh, for hydropower, yet not recognizing how that affected fish. And now, because of that, we now uh, do uh, EIAs uh, and recognizing that how uh, uh, engineering solutions create problems uh, upstream or downstream. And so we need to look at things much more holistically than we did before. It's funny how we seem to be going backwards as opposed to be forward in, in, in many ways. I mean, now you're looking to rely on the energy of the people and the wisdom of the people. And then there was a time when it, you only wanted science. And now I agree that you need a combination of both. Um, were you thrilled to see the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center headquarters coming to Belize? Absolutely. In fact, again, this is one of the things that, uh, that uh, fell into my lap uh, back in, uh, in uh, the late 1990s. Uh, and that is um, when it was um, the, the concept of a climate change center was conceived. It went to the CARICOM secretariat and, um, and I did not think Belize was interested in it. However, I got a call from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Belize and they said, and I was told, the Prime Minister understands a center is going to be, uh, a climate change center is going to be developed. You are hereby mandated to come up with a proposal and get the center to Belize. <laughs> so in fact, that was my charge. And so I then uh, developed the proposal, uh, which we then went out and sold. Uh, and so we were shortlisted. And of course, it became a political decision afterwards. But in fact, uh, so the mandate came to me and uh, I worked on it. and. Fortunately, it, it, we did manage to get the center in Belize. So, in fact, it's one of my one of my achievements. I'm proud of. Congratulations! Now, after 34 years, you could have just retired, gone to play golf, visit with your other family, but no, you still didn't get enough. Why? Well, again, interestingly, at the time of the uh, in 2005, I think it was. Um, Dr. Kenrick Leslie, who was a former chief meteorologist now and had gone back, he gone gone to the U.S., went into another career, but he came back to Belize and was the first executive director at the center. So in 2005, he called me and he says, Carlos, um, you know, um, there might be a role for you here at the Climate Change Center. Why did you consider coming to that? 
So in fact, I then moved, I was seconded to the Climate Change Center from the Met Office. Uh, and I then have been trying it now for the past uh, 15 years. So my move from the Met Office was again instigated by Dr. Kenneth Leslie, who had gotten me to the Met Office. I went to the Climate Center, joined him there. And so I've been there now for the past 15 years uh, with him at the Climate Change Center. So I have been sort of following him in my career path. Well, you must be enjoying it there. You seem to be the kind of guy that whenever you touch down, that's where you stay for as long as you possibly can. As I said, I, some for, I have been very blessed with the, um, with the, um, the challenges that have been posed and I've been able to respond to the challenges. Uh, and, um, and through that, I have been able to, um, you know, really... I, I, contribute, I think, to the entire process. Um, so um, both through the Met Office and to the Climate Change Center, um, besides working uh, uh, locally and regionally, I then um, um, be able to join uh, various posts where I can actually then uh, influence the process. And, and so it's been a really a blessing and very uh, fortunate for me that, um, you know, uh, people get to appreciate the work I've, I've been doing. Well, I'm sure we do, because climate change is a very real thing. And as the chief negotiator, you get to you get to say a lot and do a lot. What is the best deal for the small islands and the Caribbean? Uh, yes, indeed. So um, certainly we have recognized that um, small island uh, uh, countries are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, even though we contribute the least to the causes of climate change. And, uh, and so... Um, uh, last year, when uh, Belize assumed uh, the chairmanship of the Alliance of Small Island States, speaking of all the SIDS, uh, Belize asked me to be the lead negotiator on behalf of the group. And, uh, and so I've been able to draw on all the, my experiences as a, as a meteorologist and working in the region uh, on SIDS issues to, to, uh, to speak about our causes, uh, to bring big developed countries, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, lay the case before them to say, look, um, we have been good partners with you, but you have not lived up to your obligations. And so, A, you are not reducing emissions. And secondly, you have, been not, you have not provided us with the resources for us to adapt to climate change. And, and so um, we need to continue uh, uh, to press this case. And, and so uh, even uh, through this COVID crisis now, um, we are now meeting virtually. Uh, and in fact, I seem to be having more meetings uh, on the virtual platform than I had prior to COVID. Which Caribbean island is at the greatest risk for rising sea level? Uh, we are all at risk. Um, however, we must recognize that the, um, the island states that are, of, that are of coral background. So when we look at islands like uh, the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, the Cayman Islands, um, those that have no sort of elevation are certainly the most, uh, will be most impacted by sea level rise uh, because they have no retreat. Um, whereas um, the islands in the Eastern Caribbean um, would be able to move uh, higher to higher grounds. However, uh, even those, for example, um, that rely on um, groundwater are also at serious risk. So in Antigua and Barbuda, uh, Barbados, which basically have no rivers, uh, and, we, and uh, they have to draw from groundwater uh, for water resources, would also be at risk uh, because of drying. Um, you know, so water in true, uh, is now uh, in, uh, infiltrating uh, their, um, their groundwater. They have to rely now on reverse osmosis systems. So uh, the threats are significant um, uh, to all of us, and, and it's an issue that we really must address. We seem to be having more drought than, than you know, excess water. Um, last year, we had a severe drought in the north, and this year, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they're experiencing a drought. Uh, what do you think is causing this uh, weird fluctuation? Well, absolutely. Um, first of all, um, the Caribbean is one degree warmer now than it was 100 years ago. The data from our weather stations verify that. Uh, and uh, also we are seeing uh, changes in the hydrological cycle. Um, and it is logical. Um, you, just think about it. You, you take a pot of water and you, uh, you, put, uh, you put it over a stove and you start uh, and, you, and you heat it up. Obviously it boils and you see these bubbles rising up and so you see more evaporation. Your entire cycle becomes more vigorous. 
Um, and so um, we are seeing uh, episodes of longer droughts. And when the rain does occur, it occurs in more intense episodes. Uh, and so we are seeing these changes in, in the cycles uh, globally uh, around the world. In addition to that, um, all the models are showing that the Caribbean is getting drier than we had than before. Which is weird because uh, last week or so, um, I think the North experienced uh, 15 inches of rain, which is again unusual. Uh, uh, yes, indeed. So again, this is, as I said, so this is the the more uh, aggressive um, cycle that they're seeing now. However, superimposed on the general climate uh, issues, we also have your routine changes of weather. So in fact, we have a weather system over Central America right now called the Central American Gyre. Uh, it's a very large area of low pressure that encompasses all of Central America um, from about Costa Rica, north to southern uh, Mexico, a very large area of low pressure. And within it, you then had this, uh, this tropical depression, tropical storm, which developed in the, um, uh, in the Pacific, crossed Guatemala, Mexico, and now has gone back into the Bay of Campeche. So um, we have this big jar, which will last almost all of, week, all of this week. And within it, you're going to have these other smaller cyclones uh, forming in it. So yeah, many things superimpose within the general uh, climate cycle also occurring. We're going to take a break. When we come back in the third segment, we will talk about things that we can do to make our situation a little better. We're going to take a break and be back. I chose Galen because of its strong reputation, great scholarships. I came because I can take all my classes online. Because Galen University opens doors to the outside world. Their course offering in tourism. It gives me more opportunity to become who I want to be. If you want to connect with your inner champion to make the world a better place, then Galen is right for you. I choose Happy Cow Cheese because of its perfect portion sizes and I can travel with it. Because it's nice and soft and creamy and it goes smooth for your bread. I choose Happy Cow Cheese because I eat it with my beans. I eat it with my fried jock. And you know why? Because it's nice. Most of all, when you're on a plane, you know they only give you some crackers and you can just take one out and enjoy it with Happy Cow Cheese. I'm Miss Baker, and I choose Happy Cow Cheese because it goes well with all the stuff I bake. Happy Cow Cheese. Look for it in a store near you. Distributed in Belize exclusively by Emilio Ahmad and Sons Limited. Here at Coop Sheet Metal, we believe our job is very essential in serving our customers. And that is just one reason why visiting us is an experience to be remembered. Here at Coop Sheet Metal, we have a reliable fleet of trucks. We specialize in countrywide delivery of all our material. Coop Sheet Metal is a family business that was started by my grandfather who even had many of his machines hand-built decades ago to make our products the most reliable in Belize. Come visit us at our new facility on Iguana Creek Road, just past the Belize River leading to Spanish Lookout. Did you know that it's best to keep the lumber stored in a dry place? At KT Enterprises, all our wood is stored in an enclosed space. To provide our clients with the highest quality, we allow you to personally select your lumber if you choose and we deliver countrywide. Be it deck board, beams, and imported hardwoods such as red oak and white ash. At KT Enterprises, we provide you with the highest grade in treated pine, construction grade plywood, and imported hardwood. Delivered to your door. We continue to build Belize by reforesting its pine forest. Visit us today at 2.3 miles Iguana Creek Road or give us a call at 6710114 or 6720114. I'm actually doing a homework assignment on current affairs. Thanks to my TV, I could access local news anytime or anywhere I want. I'm a next-gen kid. 
NextGen's MyTV gives you the freedom and flexibility to watch your favorite sports, shows, movies on demand, news, and more. We even offer karaoke and 24-hour playback on all your favorite content. And with over 100 live local and international channels, you're sure to find something you love. NextGen, powered by Central TV and Internet. New Buildings Limited is the company of choice when it comes to design, fabricating, and erection of wide-span metal buildings in Belize. At New Buildings, we have a team of well-trained professionals that can produce the most innovative and durable metal structures. Be it domestic or industrial buildings, we can get it done for you. We have put together some of the most outstanding metal structures in the country. We also do estimates and consulting. Visit new buildings in Spanish Lookout or give them a call at 631-8723 or 610-5185. New Buildings Limited, the experts when it comes to metal structures in Belize. It's me, your Uncle Cooper, and this is a Cooper tire. Great tire. Now, it's not going to cook you a pot roast, but it will stop when you hit the brakes. And these truck tires can stop on average 10 feet shorter than other tires on a wet road. See, the trick is in the grip. And these tires grip like my handshake. Look, I'm your uncle. I love you. I want you to stop when you need to. It doesn't matter if it's for a red light or a duckling. So go with the Coopers. Cooper! And never start something you can't stop. Welcome back to the third and final segment of Morning Matters. Mr. Fuller in with us. Mr. Fuller, the hurricane season seems to be getting more intense. This year, the first named storm is already out. Um, what is the forecast for this season? Yes, indeed. In fact, the hurricane season started a couple of weeks ago with hurricane with tropical storm Arthur over the Bahamas. Uh, then uh, there was a B storm in the Gulf of Mexico last week. And now um, it's very likely that we'll have the sea storm. It's already a depression in the Bay of Campeche that uh, came up uh, from uh, the Pacific um, uh, over the weekend. So, in fact, uh, we do expect this year to be an active hurricane uh, season. In a normal year, you would have something uh, like uh, 12 uh, tropical storms, of which six become hurricanes, and three of them become intense hurricanes. This year, it's more like 12 to 17 uh, tropical storms, of which uh, about uh, six to uh, 12 of them will be uh, will be coming uh, uh, hurricanes, and uh, about five of them intense hurricanes, meaning category three or higher. And that is because of several uh, factors. First of all, this year is not an El Nino year in the Pacific. When you have an El Nino year, the Pacific gets warmer uh, compared to the Atlantic, and so more systems form in the Pacific, and you have less activity in the Atlantic. Uh, but that's not the case this year. Uh, we have more rainfall occurring over uh, West Africa than before, and that tends to form more vigorous um, tropical uh, waves that would then cross the Atlantic. The Caribbean and the Atlantic is also much warmer. The oceans are much warmer than before. And then finally, we have less shear uh, in the upper atmosphere, meaning that when systems do form, they don't tear apart. They can rise uh, more. So this year, indeed, it will be a more active year um, because of that. In addition to that, we know because of climate change, uh, we cannot uh, say whether we're going to have more or less hurricanes in the future because of that. But we know with the warmer oceans, they are going to be more intense, and the scientific data now shows it that more hurricanes, that hurricanes will be more intense than before. So all of these factors uh, will indicate that indeed um, this year is going to be an active year. And in fact, this year was the sixth year in a row where the tropicals, um, the tropical storms formed before the start of the hurricane season. And this has happened before. In fact, um, back in the 1950s and 60s, the hurricane season began in the middle of June, and we actually had to, uh, to uh, lengthen the length of the hurricane season to the 1st of June. And if this trend continues, maybe we have to consider actually beginning the hurricane season even uh, middle of May. So uh, there is precedence to this. You know, maybe there will be just hurricane season. How about that? Maybe the season will not be uh, predictable, which would be quite unfortunate. You know, it would definitely cause a lot of stress on people. What are some of the strategies that the Caribbean countries can take to mitigate climate change? 
Well, absolutely. So let me let me um, um, bring out the terminology. However, however, um, first of all, when we say mitigating climate change uh, for climate change, it means reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, so mitigation for us in the climate change context is how do we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and other uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere? And so for the Caribbean, even though we are a low emitter, we should also uh, um, you know, play our role. So it means using much more renewable energy. And we are blessed with renewable energy uh, in Belize and across the Caribbean. In Belize, we are very fortunate um, having good hydropower potential um, from our rivers. Um, we also have biomass, um, BSI, uh, you know, using uh, the waste from sugar cane production to actually power the plant to sell power to the, um, to the um, electrical company, um, wind and solar power. So indeed, we are blessed with that. And also the Caribbean, we, we can do that. Um, certainly, uh, from the land use area, um, we need uh, to address uh, how we are cutting down our forests, uh, because whenever we cut down our forests, of course, we are then also emitting um, greenhouse gases by, um, by uh, the trees, um, you know, uh, not being able to absorb the CO2 that they would have done in the future. So indeed, we need, uh, that's an area we, we can address. And um, an area for us in the energy sector that we really must address is the transportation sector. We really uh, must do much better with our mass transportation systems, not only in Belize, but across the Caribbean. Uh, a small island like Barbados in rush hour, it takes you an hour to move like 10 miles. You know, so uh, that's an area we, we need to address the mass transport system for, uh, for us uh, in that area. And in fact, just from an economic point of view, when petroleum prices are over $100 per barrel, which, we, which we they were uh, you know, a, a few years ago, we were expending 60 to 70% of, of our foreign exchange in buying petroleum. We can use that money to make us to adapt to climate change, which is the other aspect of climate change we really must do uh, uh, something about. How do we adapt to climate change uh, uh, for us? So for example, um, we need to protect our coastal zone. We need to protect our coral reefs. Um, we need to protect our mangroves uh, to cut down the erosion that's occurring on our coastlines. So that's certainly an area we, we must do. In agriculture, we must uh, adapt to climate change. We must um, use more um, um, drought resistant crops. We probably need to put in irrigation systems, protected agriculture uh, using greenhouse, uh, greenhouses for agricultural uh, production. Um, our water supply systems, we certainly need uh, to start to put in much more reverse osmosis systems uh, to, you know, uh, to use um, water. In public health, that's a big issue that now we, know, we now need to address. Um, we have much more incidences of dengue than we have had, ever had before, leptospirosis. Uh, uh, all those things are increasing in the Caribbean, and we need to do the preventive health measures uh, to address those issues. So there's a lot of work that we have to do across all sectors. It's not only for the um, climate change community to address, but the various sectors, agriculture, coastal zone, um, uh, health, all these areas now need to put in climate change into their daily, daily work schedule. Do you think that uh, one of the silver linings that has come with COVID is the fact that the world has, well, the world has begun to teach itself how to cure itself and how to take better precautions and to lessen the negative behavior in a, in a huge way? Uh, I would imagine to some degree this is also helpful, uh, helpful behavior that will lead to less emissions and all of that kind of stuff. But do you think once this COVID scare dies off, people will go back to their destructive ways? Or do you think that they would have learned something and maintained some of these healthy behaviors? I certainly hope that, um, that it leads to that helpful behavior. Uh, I have been seeing a lot of, uh, of chats, uh, you know, how people are absorbing nature much more uh, than they ever had before uh, and appreciating uh, what nature uh, has to offer. Um, however, uh, you know, um, as we try to rush back uh, to open back um, our skies for tourism and so on, uh, I'm afraid that um, we may um, overcompensate. And so I think uh, this is a good time for us to really um, put in the measures in place uh, to, to recognize that indeed we, sh um, we need, uh, A, first of all, to take uh, 
a personal care of ourselves. Um, I, I think me, uh, too often um, people assume that nothing like this could have ever happened, and many uh, many uh, persons households never had that little um, this little um, safeguard uh, in your credit union in your bank account that you had some um, some safety measures that you could rely on yourself. Um, you know, uh, for the first maybe six months that you were, did not have to um, rely on government uh, to, to, to bail you out of this process. So I'm hoping that uh, we get back into a proper banking system. Um, first of all, you know, uh, at the family level that we, uh, we can do that. Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, in the long term, recognizing that we really, do we really need uh, to, uh, each of us, drive our own car into Belize City um, from, from the north? Um, I recall, again, um, my wife would leave uh, home uh, in Ladyville to go uh, to Belize City to work, and it took her an hour to get uh, to work from 7 to 8 o'clock, and I would go to Belmapan, and I would get to work before she did 50 miles away. That was not right. Um, and um, do all of us have to drive to Belmapan? Can we put in a proper uh, bus system that will allow people to actually save money uh, and save on the environment, uh, save on gas by using public transport with good, proper buses in place, with good schedules? And I think if that were to put in place, we would cut down on this, on this uh, need for each of us having to have our own cars uh, to move 10 miles. You know, you said a mouthful, but are there additional things that we can do in our homes to try and alleviate the problem? Oh, absolutely. Um, indeed, uh, I recall growing up, uh, each household had their own vats uh, to collect uh, rainwater, um, you know, and, um, and a manual pump to pump the water uh, up to your roof and then use gravity to, to get your water back down into your house. And you had running water in your house that did not depend uh, on pumps uh, all the way from uh, 17 miles uh, up the Lee River. So uh, indeed, we, we need to put those things in place. I think um, we also recognize that our building codes uh, have changed. Um, uh, in the past, we, um, we basically used to build our homes on silts, and that was actually an adaptation measure recognizing high tides came, and when the high tide came, the water went uh, under your house. Uh, but uh, we decided, I guess, to board up and downstairs of our house and rent out the, the downstairs of our house, and then floods came along, and we said, well, what the heck is this happening here? Um, you know, so I think uh, even those things, uh, we need to uh, go back uh, to the old practices that we had. And we have better uh, building materials now. Uh, and so you can actually build better, but build smarter than we did before. You know, I remember distinctly when the tourists would come and ask, because at some point in my life, I was a tour guide, right? And I would say, they'd say, why do you build your houses on stilts? And the answer that came to my mind was, it was the style. We could park our cars underneath it, not knowing now that they built it back in the day for practical reasons. So now there you go. Now I know why they used to build it like that. But like everybody else, we build up the bottom of our house or we block it in or we rent it out for that extra, I, I don't know, three, four hundred dollars. And, 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 and Rona, let me add to that. In addition, we are now building cement homes with yes. very low ceilings. So we then have to buy fans because uh, it's too hot. And so we then uh, don't put in enough windows uh, to allow the fresh, cool air that uh, we are blessed with. And that's why we built, that's why we have a Belize city, uh, you know, to get the sea breeze. That's why people live along the coast. It was to enjoy that. But now we... Um, we seal ourselves in, uh, and during the day, it's, um, it's too hot, we get fans. In Belmapan, we do the same thing. In the day, it's too hot, in night, it's too cold. Um, so, um, yes, we need to go back uh, to uh, what nature has blessed us with. You know, you've just, obviously, you've said a mouthful, so it's true. We lock ourselves in and turn on the AC and think, yes, I've made it, when really you could just open the window and get the same effect with less, um, with less negative uh, reaction security has shown itself to be one of the issues for the Caribbean region. Is there anything that the 5 C Center can do to promote policy changes to reduce non-tariff barriers to regional trade in agricultural products? 
Absolutely. I think this is an area, again, where uh, back days we had Carifta, um, and I recall that we actually had two CARICOM boats, uh, ships that would transport uh, uh, goods across uh, the Caribbean, and that's an area we really must address. And I think... Um, at the moment, um, CARDI and the various food agencies in the Caribbean agriculture is recognizing uh, that that vision uh, that our uh, early prime ministers had of Guyana and Belize being the food baskets, and now we have Suriname being the food baskets for CARICOM, um, we really uh, now need to encourage it. Um, I was reading um, something that 90 to 95% of the food products in the Caribbean comes through Miami. Obviously, that is something um, that we really must address. Um, we really now uh, need to address not only the production, but the, uh, the transportation of food across the, the Caribbean uh, and um, avoiding, uh, you know, making a free trade across the Caribbean truly free uh, and uh, encouraging that production uh, across the Caribbean. We have the capacity, we have the brain power, uh, we have uh, the, the land, the, um, the water, everything is now available for us to do it. And we recognize that weakness of international trade um, that, uh, that has led us uh, this way. So I think it provides us an opportunity. And because we're locked down, we can actually use our brain power to come up with these solutions. We have a technology we can speak uh, to address these issues. So I know the CARICOM Secretariat um, is now uh, looking at these issues to see how indeed uh, we can uh, um, you know, uh, use our uh, natural resources within the region to address this. Do you think that this would be a good time for perhaps governments across the region to offer incentive to, incentives to families to perhaps use solar power? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, I, I think we need to, uh, to go that way. Uh, I believe that um, the Caribbean Development Bank has already, uh, you know, um, provided some of that. And I know that new funding is now available from the European uh, Union where um, uh, recoveries are now being tied to green recovery. So I, I think that is where we really uh, need to address that the recovery must be on building back better going uh, green. Um, so as we start to put in, for example, irrigation systems, we don't have to rely on diesel power to do it. We can uh, uh, go back to wind power. Um, people forget that in Belize City, our drainage canals were actually uh, powered back then by, um, by windmills. In Guyana, it was the same thing. In Suriname, the same thing. When you look at in Barbados, there's still a lot of those sugar factories where those uh, those things were actually powered by um, by windmills. So all of that is a, is a way we now need to, uh, to go back better. And in fact, wind generators are now much more efficient than they were back then 100 years ago. Mr. Fuller, this definitely was a fun conversation, educational and entertaining. But I have to ask, I mean, you retired once already and then you jump off the retirement bench quickly. Will you ever retire? <laughs> um, well, my wife tells me I can change jobs, but I can't retire. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I, I have been indeed uh, blessed uh, by, uh, by uh, you know, uh, by my various uh, careers over the years. Uh, certainly, it is now about time for me to, uh, to pass on the baton uh, to others. So indeed, I am looking at this time of, uh, as a time of reflection uh, to see, um, certainly, you know, anything can happen to, to me at any time. So I'm actually trying to see um, how I can uh, use this time. Uh, to actually uh, come up with some tools so that I can actually uh, provide um, some, uh, some training uh, to others at the center to take on the baton. Uh, and I like to use the analogy of our great Jamaican track teams where um, when they do the relay, uh, the person uh, passing doesn't stop. He runs as fast as the person picking up the baton. So there's a smooth transition. And, um, and the face you may see the next time will not be mine, but you'll be hearing the same messages. You know, I like that you have that futuristic mindset. So like, like you can say, you may never... So if you were to change your job, what would you change it to do? Well, I'm really enjoying what I'm seeing uh, nature around me. Um, so I've been talking uh, to various uh, bird watchers in the car, you know, in Belize, uh, Philip Balaram or something, telling me, well, that bird that you just sent me, that thing is actually so-and-so. 
hmm, and I'm learning as I'm going. So the brain is still going and I'm really getting to appreciate um, nature. I've been traveling too much on planes, probably contributing too much to these uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so uh, by enjoying nature, I can uh, probably learn more and actually maybe teach others through what I'm seeing at home. Maybe the next time I see you, you will be the man offering the bird tour, the bird watching tour in a crooked tree. You know, you never know. Except I want to spend the next five years learning as, a, uh, as, uh, as, one, of the, as one of the tourists first, and then maybe I get into the guiding. <laughs> I have hate to break it to you. I know you may not know this, but you're not going to live. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fuller, thank you for stopping and sharing with me this morning. I fully appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure uh, talking to you, Rona.